Well, welcome everyone. This is Foster Gamble here, and I have the great honor today to dive really deep with one of the most remarkable thinkers that I have come across. Uh, his name is Rajiv Malhotra, and he's a scientist, a philosopher, and historian. He's also a highly successful technology entrepreneur, a cultural leader, and an author. Rajiv was trained initially as a physicist and then went on to study computer science, specializing in AI back in the 1970s. And then after a successful corporate career in the US, he became an entrepreneur and founded and ran several IT companies uh, in different countries around the world. Since the early 1990s, as the founder of his nonprofit Infinity Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey, he's been researching civilizations and their engagement with technology from a historical, social sciences and mind sciences perspective. Now on a very personal note, I gotta say this was like meeting a brother from another mother for me, because those of you who know my work, uh, it fits in the category of what Bucky Fuller called a comprehensivist. Uh, since I was a child, I've been obsessed with finding and showing how all the different pieces fit together. It's like my entire life I've been climbing this mountain to get the largest possible 360 degree worldview. And then as I near the top, I come up over this ridge and here's this handsome Indian man. <laughs> and he says, hello, what, do, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's been absolutely delightful to just begin to explore with Rajiv the many areas that we touch together and not just as a, a, an intellectual uh, pastime, but because it's so critical right now. I mean, Bucky Fuller said, without comprehensivists, humanity will go extinct. It's a, it's a, there's a danger in over-specializing. So some people need to be keeping track of how the specialties fit together. So um, Rajiv has written numerous best-selling books. His last book uh, was, titled Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Power, Five Battlegrounds. And in this book, India becomes the case study to analyze the impact of AI in a variety of domains. And I told Rajiv, I, I, I had the pleasure of reading this book in the past couple of months. And I told Rajiv when I met him that I honestly feel that this is one of probably the three or four most important books on the planet right now. And that's a big claim. So we're gonna spend a couple of hours uh, where I get to show you why I think that, that, that not only this book, but uh, Rajiv's perspective is so critical right now. Now, Rajiv has written another book that we're gonna be getting into in great depth later on uh, called Snakes in the Ganga. And, uh, but we're gonna start by going a little bit into Rajiv's personal life and then a little bit into the past book before bringing it up to date on the book that's just about to come up. And I know Rajiv is gonna be beginning a, a tour of India shortly. So a long winded introduction, but uh, Rajiv, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Foster. Uh, it, it's actually uh, delightful to, to meet you. I wish I had met you decades ago. Uh, and I have to tell people that the two documentaries that you sent me are absolutely amazing. And I would like to, when we put this up on our channel, I would like to uh, give the links to these and recommend everybody should watch them because these are mind blowing. These bring out so much new knowledge, so much technology, so much philosophy, uh, world affairs. So Foster, I, I, I feel that uh, you are a king, kindred spirit and uh, uh, my uh, work and yours are, have a huge overlap. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, collaborating in in serious ways uh, with you and thank you for having me on this show and th thank you for taking the initiative uh, and we'll get started now all right well it's a great pleasure to to have you on and i know that you and i are probably used to in conversation sort of being careful in different areas of okay how can i how deep can i go you know how much does a is a person aware of and so forth and this is one of those rare conversations where i know we can simply go anywhere and I want to go right to the core to begin with uh, in your personal life and ask you really fundamentally, what is your purpose in life these days? So, you know, since childhood, I have had this quest 
for understanding the higher truth. And I have had a philosophical side and a scientific side and trying to bring them together. Uh, you know, the science can also be very material and pragmatic and I have that side in me. But I also want to understand what is happening in the universe? Why does it exist? How does it work? Uh, I, I've asked fundamental questions like, is the universe an algorithm? Well, if it's an algorithm, which it seems to be to a large extent because the laws are being obeyed in a very systematic way, then what about free will? Is there something beyond algorithms? Is it, do, is it both partly an algorithm and partly beyond algorithms? And, and if we are conditioned to behave in an algorithmic way, uh, with, with you know, in a causation way, cause, effect, cause, effect, we are trapped in this causation, uh, then how do we get out of it? Is there life beyond this causation? So I've had this uh, not only as a theoretical quest, reading a lot, but also in, through my own meditation and through my own practices experientially, I've had the the uh, great uh, fortune of uh, meeting some of the, some important people, spiritual exemplars. We call them gurus, many of them, and learning from them and and practicing these things in a very serious way. So my purpose in life, which in our tradition is called Swa Dharma, Dharma is the Dharma, but Swa means my Dharma, which means it's like you have my favorites or my something. So this is like my Dharma, meaning everybody has a Swa Dharma, but different people could have a different Swa Dharma. My Swa Dharma is to exp experiment different processes for higher states of consciousness uh, and pursue them uh, and perfect myself in a higher and higher state of consciousness as much as I can in this life. Uh, to be a better person and give back to society, uh, and both uh, evolve myself as an inner being, which is which in the in, in our tradition is called as the Atma, the inner being, and in the Western tradition you might call it mind sciences and consciousness studies, uh, and also in the outer realm, which could could be translated as social sciences or uh, the Lokika world, the outward outer world. So I want to excel, but the the key is to improve oneself through various practices, uh, evolve one's consciousness, and then take this higher inner being into the outer world. And not a outer world driven by a selfish ego, but an outer world from a higher place. So this is, in a nutshell, my calling. And I'm delighted to be here to share it with you. Wonderful. Well, on a, continuing on, on a personal note, um, at some point, as you were going along in your studies of physics and metaphysics and philosophy and engineering and so forth, at some point there must have been a kind of a turning where you realized that the world wasn't quite what you were being told by the media, by the government, by the universities and so forth. Is there a particular kind of a red pill moment when, that, that woke you up to looking deeper than people usually do? Yes, so I had a quest all the time uh, both the theory and the practice. But, you know, I was such a type A, hardworking businessman, successful, running around the world. Uh, lucky I never had a heart attack or didn't get kidnapped. And these were the days when, you know, I used to go to the e Eastern Europe and I'd go to, go to China, go to Korea, uh, go to uh, all the European countries and run my businesses and get there on the red eye at 8 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock and start working 15, 20 hours through meals and then fly off to another country. So I did all that. And, you know, <laughs> because I was doing well, so I figured, you know, wow, you know, I can keep, uh, keep uh, adding more uh, materially. But then there was always this inner quest that said, you know, at some point I got to give up. I got to let go of this because I'm not here for that. I'm just here to be self-sufficient so I don't have to be in this game all the time. And, and what happened was a combination of events that kind of were, were the tipping point. Uh, in the outer world sense, in, I, I was on the one hand making a ton of money. Uh, on the other hand, I was getting disillusioned by the quality of people that I was with because they couldn't see life beyond just making more money. And I didn't think that that was the end of life. So we would have some conflicts, some conflicts over ethics. Uh, uh, so I, I, I had this kind of a bit of a disillusionment and I kept asking myself, why do I need to go through all this anymore? And then the other part of it was uh, spiritual in encounters. I always looked out for people who are spiritually advanced to get to learn more from them. So as a result of uh, some people in the family introducing me to a great spiritual master who's no more in the body, 
uh, in Mumbai in a very humble quarters. Uh, I got to know this person and immediately there was such an experience I had uh, in a series of encounters. The experiences are beyond words, beyond description. It's sort of like, uh, you know, they say the silence of the Buddha upon having his nirvan. Uh, he didn't speak because whenever people asked a question, he didn't. There was no words to explain it, so he was just silent. Not that he was trying to uh, avoid them, but he just didn't know how to say it. And then, of course, he started teaching a lot. So I had my moment of that silence. It wasn't forty days or something like in his case, but it was there for a while. Uh, and so, when I was flying back from Mumbai to the United States, the it was becoming very clear to me. That when I go back there, I'm going to just give up all this stuff and I'm going to pursue this because I've experienced something that ought to be, I ought to know more about it. I ought to pursue it more seriously. So when I, I remember when I came back, I got my top uh, eight, 10 people around the table and I said, you know what, by the end of this year, I'm going to be out of all this. And they thought, you know, this guy, I mean, he's running around the world. Come on, you know, what, maybe, maybe he'll get over this in a few days. So they thought that I, some people thought I have a midlife crisis. One guy suggested I should meet a psychiatrist whom he knows. So people couldn't get it that I really have had enough of this. Now I want to get out and I want to do something else because I've discovered, I've experienced. And so I want to pursue that. But that's what I did. And I never looked back. And that was almost 30 years ago. I never looked back. And people for several years kept thinking that, you know, he's up to something. He's developing a new secret business somewhere. And, you know, one of these days, and he didn't want to tell us, they kept offering me, do you want to be on this board? And do you want to invest here or there? And, you know, I didn't have any interest. So as a result of all that, you know, here I am. <laughs> it's like cosmic entrepreneurship. You were investing in the unified field. <laughs> okay. So, um, we're going to talk a lot today about artificial intelligence, particularly because of the really critical role that it plays in the future of humanity. Whichever road humanity goes down, artificial intelligence is going to be a critical part of it, for better or for worse. Uh, I'm a big fan of artificial intelligence, and I'm also very concerned about artificial intelligence if we don't relate to it accurately. So for the audience out there, let's start in at the basics. What, from your perspective, is artificial intelligence? So, you know, artificial intelligence, and this should not be mixed up with artificial consciousness. Uh, artificial consciousness is, uh, or consciousness, uh, intelligence and consciousness are two different things. And then we can say what is artificial intelligence and what might be possibly artificial consciousness, which doesn't exist. So, Intelligence and consciousness are very different and you can have one without the other. Uh, you can, ha you can have a, an intelligent entity which is not conscious. So for instance, when I'm sleeping, I'm not conscious, but there's a whole lot of metabolism going on. Uh, my body is functioning, my pancreas are functioning. There's a lot of intelligent behavior, very, very precise like a machine working unconsciously. So there is unconscious intelligence in all of us. And the cosmos has both conscious beings and unconscious, inanimate, intelligent entities and processes going on. So there is one without the other. You can also have, con you can be conscious, there could be a conscious entity which has more intelligence or less intelligence. There are different, there's a whole spectrum of levels of intelligence for conscious beings. So the two are kind of separate. Of course, consciousness is primary. And consciousness manifests itself in inanimate and animate uh, and different levels of different levels of intelligence. So I, I would want to separate the before talking about artificial intelligence, I want to not bring in consciousness because people ask questions like people wonder if machines aren't conscious, how could they be smarter than us? Well, smart being smart is different than being conscious. Uh, you can have an algorithm uh, to recognize faces which actually outperforms human beings. Uh, which can recognize faces more precisely than human beings, recognize them in the dark, recognize them wearing a hat and with a beard, they can recognize the same face. Uh, so if you think of facial recognition as an intelligent process, 
you can have machines that outperform. If you consider driving uh, requiring some kind of intelligence, then you know you can have machines that can drive better than human beings, maybe faster, maybe in different raining conditions, maybe in different traffic conditions, uh, you know, and they can keep learning and outperform human beings. So you can have intelligence in machines that keeps evolving and outperforms human beings. So artificial intelligence, uh, given my software background, I want to explain it in this way. When in, in conventional software, which is before AI, normal software, the human trains the machine what to do. So the human says, here is how you do payroll. And the machine cannot learn, become smarter at it. It cannot, uh, it, there's no such thing as machine learning where the machine figures out how to do payroll on its own. So I have to teach the machine how to do payroll. And if the rules change, then I have to change my program. I have to update my program. Uh, so the human programmer it literally teaches every step that the machine should carry out. And that's normal software. Artificial intelligence is when the machine has been set up in such a way that through its own experience, it can become smarter and smarter and smarter. It can self-learn. So it self-learns through experience. And this experience is called big data. So you, you have a whole lot of experiential data that you throw through the machine. So you show it, uh, you know, uh, the right way to do something, the wrong way to do something. And the machine keeps figuring out patterns and patterns and patterns of how to do it right, what to avoid, what to, what to not avoid. And, and, and it keeps getting feedback on how is it doing. In many ways, machines learn like children. So when a child is... Uh, begin, tries to get up and it falls, the, the, the memory in the muscle uh, learns, you know, I did it this way and it didn't work out. So next time I'm going to try a little bit differently. And maybe after trying several different ways, it realizes that this is the way I move my muscles and it's a little more successful. So the child is encouraged and says, aha, it's working. And now the child tries how to do it in, in a more successful way. And it keeps getting negative feedback, positive feedback, and it records it in its muscle memory until it's able to stand up. And this is how we learn everything. So neuro neuroscientists and, uh, and uh, uh, software people collaborated to figure out models of how learning happens. And that is why uh, there are these neural networks, even the vocabulary in AI has got some, some resemblance with neurology, because the idea is to figure out how the human beings, how the brain learns, and then figure out how do we set up machines that can keep learning. So what is distinct about artificial intelligence is that is the ability for machines to learn on their own. Now, this is phenomenal because, you know, if the machine can learn on its own, uh, it could actually learn more than we do because we've put this machine together and it can keep learning. I will die, but this machine keep learning. I, I, and also think of it this way. If you have a thousand people, human beings driving a car and each of them, they're driving separate cars, each of them is learning how to drive better and better. So somebody with 20 years experience is better, he's learned a lot. And then as, he, as life goes by, he has more and more experience. But the experience of one driver is not shared by the others. I don't become smarter when faster you have learned something about driving. It doesn't help me because you, there is no cloud where all of our experiences get shared. Whereas in the case of driverless cars, all the cars that are going driving around with sensors, learning how to drive, what to do, what to avoid, what causes an accident, all of that is shared in the cloud. So all the cars get the benefit of each other's experience. So there's collective learning in AI which is very difficult for human beings. We have language and we do learn from each other, but it's not the same efficiency. The second thing is that when a machine dies, when a car dies, it's discarded. It's, it's learning is not lost. It's not like the next car has to start as a child and learn all over. The next car adopts and inherits all the learning of the predecessors. Similarly, we try to do that through lineages. We leave back books. And so that the next generation don't have to go through the same thing. But it's not, we haven't learned yet to transplant human memory into another person. So imagine if you, you could not, you could first of all merge the memory of Foster and Rajiv and all of that, a whole lot of people, in a way that, you know, there could be a collective memory that everybody can access. And secondly, if you could transplant it to another person, another generation, you would have, you would have a whole, you know, different level of learning 
than is currently possible. In the case of machines, this is artificially being kind of simulated, not exactly to the extent I'm talking about, but it is being simulated to some extent and getting better all the time. So you will see, you are seeing that AI is galloping ahead because of these advantages, because of the cumulative memory and because of the, uh, uh, the shared experiential uh, learning that uh, machines are having. So that's kind of my idea of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, what makes it, uh, what makes it uh, hugely uh, a big, one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs and discoveries that human beings ever made. And at the same time, also potentially very dangerous. So let's go into the benefits first of all. Can you just give a couple of concrete examples of the benefits to human beings of artificial intelligence? Yeah, this is wonderful. So, you know, one of the most interesting areas is medicine. Uh, you know, a lot of the human knowledge of doctors and nurses and so on is now being put into AI systems so that doctors are less likely to make mistakes and careless mistakes and forget human errors. Uh, the, more and more, the AI system is kind of prompting them. You, you feed all the symptoms and all the test results, and it can tell you the probability of what may happen and what to look for. Gradually, diagnostics is becoming more and more AI-driven. Uh, so medicine is one area. And, and also, this new the genome as a program. Looking at the genome as a program that is a biological computer, if you will, and doing different, uh, do different, uh, big, throwing big data at it and simulating in the computer how this genome behaves, how to make the genome behave in a way that you think is advantageous. So this is an enormous amount of power which could create uh, havoc also because you could do all sorts of things. But if used properly and ethically, uh, we could cure diseases. We could create a, a multiplier effect for medicine so that you don't have to have doctors in all the poor villages to treat people, but you could treat them algorithmically and from a distance. Uh, you know, in sticking to medicine, uh, surgeons, uh, so much surgery is being done using augmented reality. So if I'm wearing these goggles and I've, I've opened this person and I'm doing some surgery, then my eyes are looking at a combination of the real, real blood vessels and the real tissues, superimposed what the x-rays have shown deeper than I'm able to see. So there's two, two visions, two visuals I'm seeing. I'm seeing the actual visual, but superimposed a digital visual to give me some guidance, give me some numbers, tell me some stuff, where to go, what not to do. So that when I'm, when I'm operating on this body, I have the benefit of what traditionally a surgeon has with his eyes, but I also have the benefit of the digital knowledge being superimposed on top of it. So that's, that's the sort of thing that uh, uh, I would give as an example of uh, uh, good use of AI. Another thing is you know, uh, farming and agriculture to improve food production. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that a farmer has uh, that doesn't get passed on and then his experience doesn't get transmitted to another farmer somewhere else because it's lost, it's within the confines of a human body. And so when that human body is gone, it's gone. So now AI is uh, monitoring farms in many places to see what's the soil condition, temperature condition, all kinds of things happening, and what are the decisions the farmer has made, when did he plant, when did he not plant, what, what kind of uh, you know, fertilizer he used or whatever seeds, and kind of the AI systems that are getting all these data, correlating with the output, which one did better, which one did worse, able to figure out, learn algorithms for better and better farming. So we are, we are taking the cumulative experience of thousands of farmers, uh, multi-generation, and, and creating this brain that has got more knowledge than ordinary human farmers do. So any, I would say in both medicine and farming, the common thing is accumulating knowledge from multiple experts and beyond their lifespan and making it available to a whole large scale of people in that field. So that's... Yeah. If you can do it ethically, you know, we could be a better humanity, much better human beings if you could do it ethically. Yeah, those are great examples. And, you know, we could spend time going into education and transportation yes. and space travel. And I, I think really in every area. And that, that's what excites me so much. Uh, now let's look at the other side. What, what are the risks that we're running in developing 
uh, digital technology that is that can calculate uh, and control things way beyond the human capacity? So that's a great question. So, you know, the area of bias and prejudice, because uh, when there's human judgment, uh, uh, there can be bias. But when you put it into the algorithm, then that bias can be on a much larger scale. Mm. So if uh, it depends on how you've trained the machine. Uh, if you train the machine using uh, uh, court cases, uh, and in these court cases, people of a certain uh, ethnicity or a certain gender or some kind of some some category of people happen to be uh, in, uh, you know guilty of some crime more often than others, then the algorithm correlates it and says, okay, people of that kind of a profile are higher uh, suspects. They're higher level suspects, and it could just be that the database is biased. That this database is not a normal database, but it's a database where uh, people of a certain category were uh, having a higher rate of incarceration, and so they are considered uh, suspect. And now the algorithm has learned this bias and is perpetuating the bias. This has been found to be the case in recruitment. Uh, people have felt that uh, uh, there's, there's gender bias, there's racial bias, there's bias on various kinds of grounds. So whether it is uh, legal bias or, uh, or employment bias, bias is one area uh, that, that has a lot of danger. And coming from another civilization or non-Western civilization, I will tell you that AI has not been decolonized properly because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the prejudices against my culture have, are in the algorithms of Google. And I keep fighting with them all the time. And Facebook, because, because sometimes they think something violates community standards because it violates their sensibilities. But from where I come, it's a perfectly normal thing. Uh, and, and you know, so that's one area of a problem is that the West having more control over the algorithms and the machine train learning, unintentionally just happens to be that a lot of the prejudices uh, flow into the algorithms, and then these algorithms are used all over the world, and it's a disconnect for people elsewhere. That's a that's a problem. Second big area uh, I see as a problem is concentration of power. That the the haves and the have-nots have uh, the, the the dichotomy between them, the pyramid of power has become worse, and you, and this is very consistent with your documentaries where you talk about the control of, uh, of the financial industry, you talk about the control of the petrochemicals, the control of the pharmaceutical, the control of the food chain, all of those absolutely brilliantly analyzed by you. Now imagine that uh, instead of the JP Morgan <laughs> and instead of the human, uh, you know, Rothschild uh, and all these people, now, now you have algorithms that have embodied this kind of... Uh, uh, by this ability to create more wealth for their owners. And so now it's a force multiplier. So it's like a weapon that is not equally available to all. You know, they might say, Facebook says, okay, uh, we will let you, you, you tell us all your preferences, what ads you want, what you don't want. And then we are, you know, we'll use AI to your advantage. And everybody thinks, wow, this is very good. Uh, this AI is available to me. But the point is that Zuckerberg has obviously more rights over this AI than I do. Uh, right now it's free, okay, that's nice. But in terms of who controls the algorithms, who controls how they are being trained, uh, what is the criteria for you know, using them? Uh, obviously there's an asymmetry because there are people who are producers of AI and then there are people who are consumers of AI. So the producers of a technology have more power than the consumers. They're make they're giving it to me as a consumer, but I'm not a producer. They are the producer. They might be they might have something five years, ten years ahead of what they're giving to me. They might be giving me a scaled down version. They might be giving me a distorted version. All of that, I'm happy, and I don't have anything any choices. But they and and they they not only stand to make money, they stand to control the way the AI will be used. So I see AI as the biggest weapon for. Uh, for an asymmetry of power. Remember that the East India Company, which started the colonial enterprise from England, uh, and then there was a French East India Company, they started, they became powerful because of the Industrial Revolution. It's the Industrial Revolution of England. Everybody says that the Industrial Revolution is very good because while it killed jobs, it also created more jobs. 
But the fact of the matter is it created jobs in England and killed jobs in India. Uh, the, the, the person doing textiles, which is one of the greatest uh, exports of India for hundreds of years, the textiles all these mills to make uh, textiles you know, uh, in, in an industrial fashion. So of course it created jobs in Manchester, but it killed the jobs of a large number of people in India who used to do that. So the industrial revolution brought unprecedented wealth to a few European colon colonial powers, and it impoverished a huge, you know, very large numbers of people elsewhere. And so we had this dichotomy between colonizers and colonized. And this of course changed the world forever in a very sad, na nasty way. We are not even now not fully decolonized uh, because while there is political decol decolonization financially, people are still dependent, and in terms of the use of language and resources and power, they're still dependent. So I think this uh, this new industrial revolution, as AI is called, runs the same risk that just like the industrial revolution of you know electricity electrification of factories and steam engine, all that happened now. The, the new industrialization using AI is not going to be equal. It's not going to, it's going to be, uh, you know, Google knows how to do things with using AI more efficiently, but the guy sitting in some village in a poor country, he doesn't have that. He may end up being a consumer. They may say, we'll give you, we'll let you buy this product from us or this service from us. We might even give it to you free for a while, but in any case, you're buying it or you're getting the benefit at our discretion, at our whim and fancy. And, and you know, and the, the kind of service you're getting and how much you are getting, uh, it depends on us. It depends on our generosity. So you're making the world dependent in, 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 a, in, a, in a kind of an asymmetric way with some people having all the power. Yeah. Another yeah. advantage, another problem, third one, is psychological manipulation like social media. So I call it the moronization of the masses, which means you're turning them into morons. So the more and more people becoming morons, but happy morons, if we, they're told that, oh, you're happy, you can, you can watch the movie you want, and uh, you can binge watch uh, you know, pornography, you can you fantasize that you are going uh, to a holiday somewhere, and you can do all of those things. Uh, so people are, but people are dumbing down their choice making. You are on autopilot, and Netflix is telling you what's the next movie to watch. And somebody is telling you who's the right dating partner. And somebody is telling you what's the right food to have, which is a recommended uh, restaurant. So, you know, they are figuring me out. They're figuring out what are, what are, what are my uh, hot buttons? What, am I, what are my desires? What am I likely to respond to? Because the more accurately they can figure me out, the more accurately they give me choices what to buy. And that's how they make their money from advertisers. Advertisers are moving into these AI systems. And that's why the Google and the Facebook people are so rich because they have these algorithms that drive people's behavior in a manner that the person who's paying for the ad or paying for the promotion is going to reward the, the platform. So the, 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 the commerce is being driven through these platforms and the consumer is being more, his thinking is being molded in a certain direction. Uh, so he's moving, he's becoming more and more uh, buying on default, choosing by default, Default meaning like he doesn't have to make a choice. It's like being made for him. So he's becoming dumbed down. He's becoming dumbed down. And as long as he thinks that he's doing well, dumbed down, you know, he'll continue getting dumbed down. Sad thing is, you know, when I talk to people who are like in their teens or pre-teens, they're very smart. They're very, they know about all these new technologies. I ask them, aren't you concerned about your privacy is being is taken and somebody is deciding what to do for you? And they're, they're not concerned. They're saying, well, that's cool. So it's become cool to be moron. It's become cool to be uh, kind of somebody who's driven by all this. Uh, as long as you have the latest gadget and the latest, you know, buzzwords, uh, it, it's cool. So I, I think this, the AI industry is succeeding because they're making their money. Intelligent people don't make good consumers of advertising because intelligent people ask questions. They'll think for themselves. Whereas if you are just lulled into it because it's so aesthetic and so beautiful, the models are beautiful, the music is nice, all those things are promising you sound great and you don't have to do a darn thing, this will all happen for you. You know, you just sit back and you kind of cruise through life. 
uh, and this uh, metaverse make it even more so because now it will be more exciting. So I think that this is the this modernization of the masses combined with uh, the the uh, concentration of power with a few people, combined with the the bias that exists that in AI. When you put all these together, uh, it can be pretty nasty for the future of humanity. Yeah. Well, that's great. That, let me. Uh, you, you're you're stepping into some of these battlegrounds, and this is what you unpack so beautifully in uh, your last book. And so I want to circle back and go into that a little bit. First of all, I want to share my screen and show everybody what this uh, what this book looks like, so that you can get a hold of it. Uh, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Power. First time I read that title, uh, I mean, my body just started resonating because it starts building, you know, with artificial and then intelligence is going into the future. And then it nails it with this is all about power. You know, are, are we going to destroy ourselves through our battles over power over each other? Or are we going to actually discover the spiritual power within ourselves and the power of honoring each person's sovereignty. So I want to, what I want to do, you do a great job in the forward to that book of actually uh, doing a succinct summary of each of those five battlegrounds. And I'm going to ask you to do that uh, even more succinctly for this conversation. Uh, so the, the key battlegrounds that Rajiv identifies in this book are, first of all, economic development and jobs. So what do you want to say about that as a battleground for AI? So, you know, economic development will get the benefits that we talked about earlier. Uh, and lots of new jobs will be created in the AI industry. But the concern I have is that this development will not be, uh, not be uh, consistent across all strata. Uh, and the job will be not for, the, for all people. Maybe in Bangalore, they will have a huge amount of development and a huge amount of jobs will be created. But in the hinterlands of India, the jobs will be lost. Uh, just like uh, in the United States, Silicon Valley may come out ahead and there'll be more billionaires. But in the, in the Midwest, you know, in the old tech, uh, old manufacturing, old rust belt, people will lose jobs. So I feel that the disruption in the economy and in the employment is going to happen. The new jobs will be there. No, I don't doubt that. But the new jobs will not go to the same people who lost the old jobs. Some of them are not trainable. Some of them are too late in life to train. And, and who's going to retrain? They say things like, uh, uh, we will retrain the workers. So I went and asked the McKinsey people. I went and asked some of these auditors who put out these reports for their corporate uh, people to sort of hush up the problem. They don't want to uh, create a crisis in, in, the, in the public. So I asked them, when, you, when your client says that, okay, these jobs will be obsolete and these jobs will be created and will be retrained, have they set aside the budget required? Uh, are you sure how many months of training it takes per employee? or how many years of training? And is there that much budget that they'll keep paying them the salary and retrain them? And even if they're not as good as the younger people, they will still hire them. Is that part of corporate policy? And the answer is hell no. So it's just, just sort of a nice facade, a nice way to keep you happy and get, keep you off their case. But real, I mean, it would be more honest if they said that we, when we institutionalize AI, we look at the impact on human beings and we, to, we fund them that money. We put that money uh, out to take care of the problem. It's sort of like if Pepsi Cola were to say that every time we make a can of Pepsi, we know the environmental cost of cleaning it up because somebody will throw it somewhere. So we are going to allocate X amount of money for every can to go and do the cleanup. And we'll allocate it to some local people who are doing the cleanup in the environment because we are creating the problem by making that can. So if they were, if it were a full life cycle, effect. Uh, just like in the case of uh, pollution, the a life cycle on the whole environment has to be paid for by somebody. Similarly, in the case of AI, if you look at the entire ecosystem of human beings, what's the effect on the economy? Some industries will die, some industries will be created, uh, jobs, same thing. If they were to put aside actual money, that would be a different goal. That would be a totally different goal. Right now, I'll tell you, one state in India, Tamil Nadu, in the south has 
about 5 million jobs in the automobile sector. But this is the old automobile. It's not the electric car. It's not the driverless car. It's the internal combustion engine. So they're making carburetors, they're making spark plugs, and there's all these guys. They're going to be out of work in five, by the second half of this decade because they're, 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 they're marketing this to the world, the world's largest auto manufacturers in Japan and USA and Europe. They're selling all these things, making them in India. But the fact is, have people gone across national boundaries and looked at the impact and said, I'm going to make this new thing. It's going to be better for everybody, but there's going to be an effect over there. And those people haven't been told. Nobody's telling them, you see. And I feel very sad for them because they're just ordinary human beings like us. Nobody has told them that your job will be gone like that one day. And, you know, it'll be gone to some other place in the world and you don't have anything to say. So that's a, that's a, problem. It's an opportunity for some. It'll make a lot of money and it'll create new job opportunities, but it'll also harm some people. Well, that's one of the advantages of your being a comprehensive thinker is you're actually looking at the whole system. You're looking at the whole job cycle. You're looking internationally. You're looking actually, is this going to work for the planet? Is this going to work for the for humanity, not just for a few or for a particular company? And, and yes, there's the training of jobs. And even a further nuance of that is once they start with neural implants um, yes. and various AI chips and so forth, will they hire you if you haven't been chipped? If you if you don't have a a, a plant uh, an implant in, in your brain and so forth, so it's going to get very complicated. And obviously, we need a compass to right. be able to navigate the ethics of this. And we're going to get into the into that later on. But let me go on to the second battleground that you identify in, in your last book. So the next one is, the next one is power in the new world order. What do you mean by that? I know you were talking a little bit about already about centralization of power, but uh, apply that to the new world order. So I see uh, a new uh, kind of a recolonization of the world with AI, just like the previous colonization happened with the previous industrial revolution. So I see that United States and China uh, will become like England and France. You know, Britain and France were the two industrial powers. They're fighting each other, the way US and China are fighting each other, fighting each other for territory, fighting each other for colonies. In fact, you know, there were wars between the British and French in India. Uh, they would, they would uh, bring in Indian soldiers on their side and the French would bring in Indian soldiers on their side and they're fighting for territory. Uh, so I see the United States and China being like Britain and France fighting each other, fighting each other for world power, but also recolonizing. China has a lot of colonial imp uh, footprints in Africa, Pakistan, many kinds of countries that they've taken over almost. And United States has its uh, sphere of influence. So my, I feel that uh, uh, the, the new world order will be kind of polarized into different camps and AI will be a huge weapon uh, in, in order to organize these, uh, organize this power. Not to talk about the actual militarization uh, of uh, of the battlefield in a physical sense, in terms of the uh, you know AI robotic soldiers and drones and all kind of you know intelligent devices that are far more dangerous than human beings. So power in the new there'll be a new world order. It'll be uh, it'll be a whole new system of power, and uh, the, 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 they, this will all be AI driven. Yeah, they, and th I want to to pause on this one for a minute because it's so huge. Uh, if, and there are people out there in the audience who are not familiar with the term, the new world order, you know, check out Rajiv's books, check out uh, the Thrive documentaries, because this, this is a very real agenda. It's beyond any particular individual or organization. It's an agenda to control the entire planet, all the resources and all of humanity. Now that's a big task. It used to be impossible, even though it's what all the, the psychopathic dictators have always dreamt of. It's becoming more and more feasible looking to the people who wake up in the morning thinking, how can I keep my fear at bay by controlling everyone and, and everything? And the answer is because the technology allows for the possibility of complete surveillance of full spectrum dominance, as they call it. It allows for what some call quiet weapons for silent wars, uh, where 
we can be colonized, taken over, controlled without even knowing that it's happening because there aren't bombs dropping out of the air, but our businesses are being closed or our vaccines are being uh, mandated or we've, uh, we've had our inflation uh, in the economy, which has destroyed the purchasing power of our currencies and so forth. And these are all very well thought out schemes to create a new order, which is basically the old socialist, communist, fascist, complete dictatorship, but with no one to come to the rescue, at least no one from this planet. That, that's the plan to create a global technocracy and use AI for the social credit score, to monitor people's bank accounts, monitor their movement, monitor their emotions and so forth, to monitor everything and then to be able to control it, where if you don't go along with their agenda, then they can impact you instantly. They can shut off your, your bank account. They can, uh, if you've got a neural chip, they can affect your emotions. They can affect your thoughts and so forth. So it's a very scary possibility that some people are very sincerely going after. So when, when Rajiv is talking about power in the new world order as a battlefield for artificial intelligence, uh, this one is really, really critical to all of our futures. So let's go on to the third one. So, so on this one, yeah, on this one, I think it's good to remind people that my next book, which we'll talk about, Snakes in the Ganga, yes. actually to, goes into this, in a, and you you have some slides on that. Actually, the, that goes into the this new world order thing, uh, the globalists and all that stuff in a, in a whole the whole eight hundred page book on that topic. Yeah, that's why I'm so excited to have some real time to dive in with because I I, I wanted to to get a, a sense of your personal path and then to dive into the this scenario that you have been laying out. And we will do that. And then we'll go into the, to the content as well of the next book. And then we will, will in this conversation, we'll focus on uh, solutions. Well, what's, what are the ways out of this? Because I think we're on the same page very much in terms of what's possible in that regard as well. And frankly, most people aren't even thinking in those terms yet. Right. Okay, so let's, go on to number three in the key battlegrounds of artificial intelligence. And this is the psychological. You've already touched on that. You want to say any more about that? Yes. So, so this, is, this, is where, uh, this is where the uh, uh, psychological control of desires has to do with the modernization of the masses, uh, feeding, gratifying the person through uh, AI-based social media, AI-based uh, you know, interactive media, uh, the, the, this uh, metaverse is going to be taking us to the next generation of uh, uh, having the desires met. But as I satisfy more and more desires through some platform that I've subscribed to, I actually turn over my agency to them. Because, you know, it's like uh, I don't need to do much. They're taking care of me. It's having, I'm having a good time. I just relax and everything is being done for me. And you know, I'm on cruise control. <laughs> and so what has happened is that I lose my faculties. I, they atrophy. They atrophy. I'm no longer, uh, I, I don't know, don't have too much judgment. And I don't even know if I had a judgment, what, how to exercise it because I lost this control. So this is, this is what psychological uh, uh, programming is doing to humanity on a very large scale. And it's happening rapidly. This is what my wife and creative partner, Kimberly, calls creepily convenient. They're making it so convenient that we can easily become very lazy and, and begin to succumb. And then by the time you start to wake up, if you do at all, uh, there's no longer any choice. What was, what was convenient is now mandatory. You know, okay, so while, go ahead. While researching for this, I came across some consultants who very proudly shared with me that they actually specialize in teaching the AI companies how to psychologically control control the consumer. I mean, there's, there, there's, there's, there are actually metrics, there are actually measurements to see how, uh, which person has been, is responding to us more, uh, uh, how much is he trusting us, our choices, their scores, and the algorithms are rated based on how good a job they're doing. And there's competitions on how to develop better algorithms to uh, uh, make the people more psychologically controlled by you. So this is a very scientific engineering pursuit being perfected. 
Yeah, this goes to the work of Edward Bernays and the, uh, on propaganda. And the whole thing is social engineering. It's applying yes. mechanical principles as best they can to actually get inside our psyches and have us willingly go along with their agenda in ways that we would not if we were thinking critically and understood what's really going on. Yes. So, so to begin to refine our agency and to discover some ways out of this, let's go on to the next battleground, which you identify as the metaphysics of the self and its ethics. Please talk about that. So, you know, I was raised in this whole field of consciousness evolution. Uh, and and there are so many people in the yoga movement, in the meditation movement, uh, uh, and, and they are into techniques to raise your consciousness to higher, higher levels of consciousness. And we saw the future of humanity as, uh, as a path of higher consciousness. So we are becoming less egotistical, less, uh, you know, contained within the biological machine of the human body, uh, tapping into cosmic energies, cosmic forces and evolving. So that's one path. And now there is a path which contradicts that and competes against that, which says that the way human beings will become more functional is through implants, through algorithms that are inside, not just outside. Firstly, there were algorithms outside on my desktop and my handheld, and they are running my life. And then there are algorithms where you, I wear goggles and they're even closer and more intimate. And then the next stage is they come inside me and they're implanted. But all these algorithms, wherever they are outside or inside, they are controlled by other people. The average guy who's the consumer of all this is not, he doesn't know anything what's happening. They're controlling him. So what we are develop, what we are having is a, a, a competition, a conflict between the two parts of evolution of the self. One is uh, the natural consciousness evolution. Uh, the other is a controlled industrialized uh, advancement of uh, the human performance uh, using artificial means. Uh, and the, the latter seems to have won the last decade. Uh, prior to AI, uh, everybody was very confident that, you know, this consciousness movement is the future of humanity and we won't have dictators and negative guys and bad guys because everybody will be evolved and they will see sense in uh, not trying to micro-optimize for their own selfish goal, but for all of humanity. That's what we were hoping would happen. But now suddenly the technology has made it possible for the, the greedy people, the selfish people, the megalomaniacs, that this technology uh, will allow them to control a large number of people. So that's the frontier of ethics, I think, is the, uh, the self versus the biological enhanced, artificially enhanced machine. Am I, am I a self? Or am I this machine? And if I'm a self, then should I be evolving that self, uh, you know, not dependent on this machine, but independent of it, higher than it? Uh, if to the extent I'm a machine, I should be buying all the latest gadgets to help me uh, evolve my, uh, advance my performance. So that's the conflict. That's the battleground that I'm talking about. Okay, great. And we're going to explore that in depth uh, very soon. Um, but let's go on to the fifth one. Um, in your book, you use India as an example of this battleground, and I think it's a particularly uh, appropriate one. Why do you see India as a particularly important battleground for this, uh, this challenge between the self and the robot? You know, India is important because India brought to the world this whole consciousness idea in the 60s and even before, based on very ancient rishis and yogis. So India is, a, India is a, known to be a place that should champion that. And when India gets compromised, then that whole movement is threatened. And the reason India is compromised is that this new materialistically driven, billionaire driven, uh, you know, uh, kind of a greedy, uh, uh, AI driven, mechanized, uh, you know, advancement of human performance has entered India. Uh, Indians are the largest uh, contingent of uh, AI engineers in the world. 
I mean, most people don't know this, but if you look at the places like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and all that, they have tens of thousands of people of Indian origin, not only living in Silicon Valley, working for these companies, but also their subsidiaries in Bangalore and Hyderabad and other places. So the Indians are the brains or among the large, a large percentage of the brains being used, uh, but they are being brainwashed. These young people are being trained not in 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 uh, ethically in consistent with their own heritage not with the values of their own background but kind of being westernized in this in this sense and the compensation is very good some of them make lots of money uh, you know you see the ceo of google and the ceo of microsoft and all kinds of other places uh, they are all uh, many of them are of indian origin uh, and of course in the rank and file a lot of them have made tons of money, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars they made. So India, in a sense, has sold out. I mean, this is very sad. It's the, it, India has sold out, or at least a large portion of the people have sold out. They become part of this global elite. And, and they are betraying their own heritage that produced the genius in them. And they've sold out. So it's very sad to me uh, as an Indian. And also, this is a significant story to bring out before it's too late. I hope that some people will change it, change course. It's significant to bring out because India is also seen as a role model for other developing countries. A lot of Latin American and Asian and African countries have looked up to India as a good case study where you get out of colonialism, you become a democracy, you industrialize, you build an economy, educate your people, and you know they start doing well. So there is that India story, which every Indian is proud of, justifiably so. But as it gets compromised, if it gets compromised along the lines that I fear, then you know the India story is lost even for the rest of the world. So I, I, for all these reasons, I made India my case study in this book and also in the next book, uh, in order to warn people that uh, you know the India of uh, the past that we knew has changed. That India is sort of disappearing, and for the be for better or worse, there is this whole new kind of India emerging, and there could be some problems. So your next book, I, I, it's my understanding that you really go into this. Uh, yes. You had written a previous book called Breaking India. Uh, it looks like this is subtitled Breaking India 2.0. If, if you had, had, had taken other uh, countries as an example, you could have called it alligators in the swamp or rats in the closet or cockroaches right. in the kitchen or psychos in the boardroom. Uh, but culturally, you chose to call it snakes in the Ganga. So first of all, before we dive into this, can you tell people where is the best place for them to get access to both of these books? So you can go to uh, you can go to Amazon. Amazon has them. You go to Amazon and you can buy this uh, artificial type artificial intelligence in the future of power. It's available. Uh, you can go to Amazon and buy snakes in the Ganga. Uh, you you could go to this. For Snakes in the Ganga, because it hasn't been released yet, you can go to www.snakesintheganga.com. And that is our website, and we're taking pre-orders, and we'll start shipping them as soon as the book is out. So people are, I would love to have people in this show go and buy themselves a copy. Yes, please, please do. I've, I've, uh, I've pre-ordered one already. I really look forward to reading that. And I, I understand that you will be uh, starting soon on a tour uh, beginning in India to spread the word on this book. Can you talk about that? Yes. So uh, the plan is uh, I'm leaving next week uh, and uh, 26th of September, we're doing a launch. Then on the 30th, we are doing another big event. And then I go from Delhi to Bangalore to Chennai to Ahmedabad, four cities we'll do. And then I'll, I'll come back next year for more because I didn't want to crowd up too much. We have about a dozen or more events already in India. I come back to the United States in, at the, in late October. And then November, December, we are tou touring the United States and Canada. Uh, we have fixed up uh, many events in uh, Toronto, uh, then in Boston, in the Harvard area, uh, New York, New Jersey. We're going to the Bay Area, Southern California, uh, Texas, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Atlanta. These are some of the places where events are being fixed up and then we go back to india next year and also europe we have various places in europe that are lining up for this so it's going to be a busy six months and i'd love to have you come along for 
as many of these as you want to because I think we have a story to tell. Uh, we both can make a good kind of pair of speakers. We can talk about different aspects of it, your experience, my experience. Um, and so that's what this, uh, this whole new book campaign is for. Well, thank you. And thanks for that invitation. I, th I think it could be exciting for people to hear two guys of our ages. I, I looked it up and, you, and uh, I'm three years older than you. Um, but we're both hanging in there pretty well. That's an ambitious schedule that you just set out. So you're obviously still very, very energized. But I think it could be very helpful to, uh, for people to hear uh, elder guys with multiple facets to their backgrounds who've come to such similar conclusions uh, about what's really going on, about uh, the challenges, and also about uh, some of the ways that we could solve these problems. So before we get to the solutions, I want to go a little deeper into some of the things that I think you, you, well, you cover, I think, in both books, but especially in the second one. I've only read the final chapter because that was all that was available, um, but you do somewhat of a summary in there. So I feel like I have somewhat of a feel for the book. So uh, one of the things I want to ask you about while we're talking about India as the battleground is fill us in a little bit uh, on what has been the history of Western philanthropy in India. So, you know, Western philanthropy is often a mask for social engineering. Yeah. Uh, I mean, philanthropy is like that anyway, a lot of places. And a lot of this so-called impact investing, you know, they are impacting in, in accordance with their own ideology, their own value system. But that may be okay, may not be okay. It depends on who is the person creating that impact and who, who's, whose idea of uh, the value it is, you know. So in India, the westernization uh, has uh, killed local languages, attacked local faiths and spiritual traditions, uh, you know, local uh, uh, ways of life. And this is true all over the world. In fact, India is one of the, one of the many targets. And so Western philanthropy, when they send when they send out people, these Harvard trained people or wherever they train, they have this uh, liberal arts ideas based on the Western thought. And they try to evaluate that and they try to uh, give grants to those Indians who are like them. And so Indians try to behave more and more American uh, in order to get the money. Uh, and so they kind of uh, become Americanized and become alienated from their own grassroots. Uh, and many of and this creates tensions. This creates uh, social tensions, communal communal violence. Even uh, the, it's a, then it's a new category of haves and have-nots that are created. Those who are Americanized and privileged in all this, and those who are not. Many NGOs are uh, living off of the you know funding they get from the Western countries, and so they're spending more time trying to impress the Western donor than to being genuine and real and doing actual work. I mean, there are some some communities where uh, they need help. They are really in trouble. They, they, are, they, are, they are genuinely in the socio demographics. They are downtrodden. They need more help. But the leaders are not helping them. They're sitting in Harvard and they're enjoying some limelight and giving speeches. And, you know, so there is this white guilt that says that I want to help those people, uh, but I don't have the time to worry about all the details. And this guy seemed like, and he's a he's a brown skinned guy, and he seemed like he he's uh, he's saying the right things. And this guy has picked up what I want to hear, <laughs> so he's just telling me what I want to hear, and I keep funding him and feeding him. I don't know what the heck this where this money is going. So the westernized Western control of uh, philanthropy has a lot of problems, and then there are some other issues like you know Bill Gates managing all the seeds. And, and, and I'm so glad you, I'm so glad in your documentary, you featured uh, Vandana Shiva. She's a dear friend of mine. And, and uh, we've had many, my very first book, she, she was involved in launching in, in, in there. And, and now I'm going to go back and talk to her again. Uh, so she's been a fighter of this whole corporatization of farming and seeds and fertilizers and food. Uh, you see, so I think the, uh, and and she's considered she's on the radar of all these people. They don't like her, okay. So a lot of us are on that <laughs> radar uh, because she's telling the she's resisting this uh, business of uh, uh, you know what Bill Gates is up to. As an example, I mean I, I don't want to be hating anybody. Bill Gates is a nice guy. He's made his money the hard way, and he has a right to spend it how he wants to. Uh, 
but we have a right to criticize it. I mean, he has a right to his point of view and put his money where his mouth is. And we have a right to critique and evaluate it and say there are some good things about it, but there's some bad things about it. So as far as Bill Gates is concerned, the largest collection of genetic databases is done by two people. One is uh, Bill Gates and the other is the Chinese. The Chinese have got their outposts in India and Africa and everywhere. And in the guise of giving you uh, a free uh, test of COVID <laughs> uh, and genetically sequencing the COVID in you or giving you some free shot of something, uh, they are doing all this database gathering. And when you build genetic databases of 8 billion people in the world, this is the biggest database that, can, that human beings are thinking of collecting so far. It's bigger than all any man-made database of things because each human being is so much data. There's, you look at all the people, it's a lot of data. And this is what then can be used to simulate uh, this particular molecule or this particular aspect of the molecule. What will it do to this race or that race or males or females or people of this kind or that kind? So you can literally sit on a dashboard one day and you can custom make a, 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 a kind of... A, a virus that will attack certain people and not attack certain people. Uh, 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 some kind of a solution that will help the life of this, this group of people if they pay for it and not that group of people because they haven't paid for it. So this business of, uh, you know, psychologists tries to profile people's mind. Genetics profiles the whole body in far great, greater detail. And so understanding the genomes of all the human beings on the planet is this project. And it's not something that average guys, you know, we guys cannot go, we don't have the wherewithal to go out and do all this, but the only certain people do. And so uh, I think that this, uh, this business about philanthropy, they buy off the reviews. They, they run the philanthropy journal. They, they organize the philanthropy conferences. So, you know, it, there's hardly any truly independent, neutral evaluation and critique of what's going on. So, so philanthropy in this context could be referred to as kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, you say the right things, um, but then the actual agenda ends up destroying many lives. Yeah. While we're on that theme, uh, I'd like to, you to talk a little bit about ESG and about the impact of something like ESG in India as an example of what it is starting to do around the world. What is ESG? Wonderful. Wonderful. So it sounds very good. Uh, e is for the environment. So corporate people should be evaluated based on how good they are for the environment and given points for going green and carbon footprint disappearing, all that stuff. And S is for social justice. And, you know, do you have uh, minorities? Do you have blacks? Do you have women? Uh, you know, th those kind of things. And G is for governance. You know, what sort of governance you have on your corporate board and so on. So now this is a huge business for Pricewaterhouse Coopers and Ernst and & Young and Deloitte and McKinsey and World Economic Forum. World Economic Forum came up with this whole thing, you know, and they are a big target for us in this book. Uh, they came up with this way to spread the imprint of a few people, the, the footprint of a few people to go to the corporate people and start evaluating them. And if you want to get investments, you want your share price to do well, then your ESG score should be high. And guess what? We are the guys who are the ESG doctors. We'll charge you a lot of fee and do an ESG audit. And we'll tell you if you're good or not good. And if you're not good, we'll advise you for another fee, how to become better. So this is a kind of a, there's a huge conflict of interest because there is a certain group of people who define what is best for humanity. And they continue evolving it and defining it in their own ways. They make it sound very nice. I mean, the PR is very nice and very compelling. Uh, so that is the, the, uh, the, the core strategy. And then they are the ones implementing it. You would think that people who define the standard uh, are, should not be the ones who are implementing it and making money to evaluate you. I mean, there are, these, there are all sorts of uh, uh, other situations where there are conflicts of interest and the, the same person cannot be doing both. Uh, for example, the, your, the, the person who keeps your books as a CPA cannot be doing your audit. It has to be an external auditor. So, but, you know, you, you think that, <laughs> that people who designed and developed these ESG standards for the whole world to follow, which is itself an issue and itself a biased game, 
they shouldn't be the ones who are going out and evaluating and making money and then showing you how to improve it. So it's sort of like a rigged game. It's sort of like a rigged game. And, and uh, people in the United States have gotten into it. So in India, they have no choice, but the big corporates feel that they better be ESG compliant. It's very fashionable. I have friends whose kids, young kids, they're all becoming ESG experts and they take a course from some uh, American company to get a stamp saying, oh, this guy knows ESG so he can get a job somewhere. Uh, this whole thing is a scam in a sense uh, because the if you really look at what their criteria is, it's not culturally compatible for one thing. It's not culturally compatible. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, there are certain universals, you know, you don't want to burn fossil fuels and you don't want to, I mean, you want to have more green energy and things like that, fine. But there are a lot of uh, lot of instances I'm coming across where uh, the, the people getting ESG ratings, like British Petroleum getting very high ESG rating because, you know, they know how to fund these guys and play the game. So right. it, it, uh, it's a game. If you have the money, you can hire smart ESG consultants. You can get a good rating and you look like you're doing very well. Uh, and, and so this is a, a bit of a scam. Well, you make a wonderful comparison, I think, uh, in your new book, Snakes in the Ganga, uh, comparing ESG uh, at the corporate level to the social credit scores at the individual level like they're doing in China. Could you describe that a little bit? This is a very important point you picked up. I'm very glad. You know, we are critical, people in the West are critical of China developing the social credit system uh, to monitor the behavior of the uh, Uyghur Muslims and so on, and maybe people in Hong Kong and maybe people in Tibet. So the idea being that everything you do, whether you run through a traffic light or not, whether you are, you are telling the truth in some application, whether your social media, you're praising the government or criticizing the government, all kinds of behavior of yours are scored because AI monitors everything you, you do and these algorithms score you and that's called your social credit. And if your social credit is good, then maybe they'll bump you to a, a business class or a first class ticket. Maybe you'll get a theater ticket somewhere. Uh, your kids who are applying, maybe they get admission and you, you are ill, you get into a nice hospital. So your social credit will, will determine the rewards given by the government to you. And if somebody is not given, not getting a good score, he's kind of like an outcast. He will be a bad guy. They may not throw him in jail right away. Maybe if he's too bad, they might, but they will. he will not be uh, in the good books of the government and he will not be well thought of. His reputation will not be as good. So this is a social credit system to manage people's behavior, make them obedient to a kind of a tyrant. Now we, everybody, Every liberal American is very upset at this, but we don't realize that we are also doing this. Uh, you know, the American social credit is just dis decentralized. There is a financial credit, which is credit rating. Uh, there is Google scoring me on, you know, what all I'm saying and not saying and whether I'm Google compliant or not is being rated. All the, the tax returns I fill, fill out are being evaluated and the government knows, you know, what is this guy's spending pattern and whatnot. So the databases exist and these databases are in different hands, but these databases are also being compared and people are cross licensing databases of each other. People know, uh, you know, what is my buying habit and is it good or bad uh, according to their value system. So the individual, uh, Database management, a database, uh, you know, uh, hijacking privacy issue uh, and turning people into morons, which we talked about in the other book, is the social credit system at the personal level, whereas ESG is the corporate credit system, social credit system. An institution is being evaluated for its behavior in society as per the establishment's criteria. And individuals like you and I are being evaluated in the social credit system as per our personal behavior. So, you know, the entire society, both at the institutional corporate level and at the individual level, is, is slipping rapidly into this kind of a dependency. I'm so glad that you're bringing this out because the, particularly in the United States uh, and particularly in the with uh, 
people orienting toward uh, the liberal wing politically, they're so afraid of being shamed, uh, so afraid of being made to feel guilty that they're being manipulated in ways that most of them, there's a ton of them, literally millions of them waking up, but there's still so many people who don't realize how they're being used. And you further broke it down in a way that I found chillingly accurate. When you, you talked about cancel culture and wokeism, being like apartheid and untouchability. You actually referred to it as a digital caste system. Go into that a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. These people are fighting what they think is the caste system in India, but they're creating a much worse caste system of their own. Uh, so so this, this business of uh, co-opting people that they feel are the oppressed, and the oppressor is the establishment of a country, uh, in the United States, it would be white, uh, heterosexual, male. Uh, and in India, it would be the whoever is the elite people or people doing well or people who are established. In every country, there'll be some people who've done well. So the idea is to get the that get the underclass who are not done well to revolt and destroy, de dismantle these structures, because that's what Marxism says you should do. For every thesis, you should develop an antithesis. There should be a clash and breakdown of society. Now, the Marxists have never figured out how to build a new structure. They know how to destroy the old structure, but they don't know one darn thing about how you build a structure. Never, They never had any kind of a success, whether it's the Soviet Union or it's North Korea or it's Korea or it's uh, Cuba or anywhere. They never had any success in building anything new. So how, why should a country like India say, OK, they're going to destroy my old structures in order to build a new structure? Well, who the hell knows what's, what the new structure will be? Maybe there'll be a takeover and you'll be more vulnerable and you'll get recolonized. So this is the, the, the thesis of uh, uh, Klaus Schwab, his book, the, the Great Reset. He says that things like COVID are an opportunity because you reset these people, they become so dependent out of fear. If you tell them take the injection, they'll take the injection. If you say wear the mask, they'll wear it. If you say don't wear it, they won't wear it. They are so scared that they will do, they will obey blindly whatever we tell them to do. And so this is an opportunity to turn them into what I call morons. We manage them and we, we moronize them. So this is this is what's happening uh, on, a, on a very large scale. Uh, the, and, and that is what uh, what concerns me. Uh, so that's, this happening on, that's happening on the mass level. But I want you to break out one further thing that I, I think a lot of people haven't thought of. Uh, and it has to do with how people uh, like Bezos and, and Zuckerberg and they, these people who have literally become billionaires through a free market capitalist system, or at least some semblance of that, then they turn right around and sponsor Marxist ideologies like CRT, you know, critical race theory and so forth, that dismantle those very structures of how they made their wealth. And for most people, they go, well, that just doesn't compute. So they must be good guys or something like that. So can you unpack that one for us? Yes. So I was at a, a gathering of a large private bank uh, and whom I happen to know. And so there were a lot of their wealthy investors there. And so they asked me, what's the, give me, give us one point in this new book because uh, we haven't read it, but we will one day, but tell us one point in this book. So I asked them this question. I said, all those who made a lot of money, some of you guys sitting here, but those not sitting here, like the Bezos and Zuckerbergs and all these people, uh, they made their money on free market capitalism. So why do you think they want to support critical race theory and, and Marxist ideas whose primary ultimate goal is to dismantle all of this, all these structures. Why do you think they would like to shoot themselves in the foot? And the whole room was absolute silence. They were so interested. <laughs> so they said, tell me, tell me, tell me. And, and, and I said to them, you got to buy my book, man. So, <laughs> but I'll tell you. so I, I will, I will tell, I will tell you because I think we are on the same page. So I'll tell you. So the thesis that we, I have in this book, is that before a new world order, you need to create a world disorder. The world disorder will create the chaos, the great reset, in order to create opportunities 
that people will be so helpless, they will come to you and you are the ones who have all this data, you have all the algorithms, you know what, who wants what, and you know how to give it to them. You are, you've are you turned them into morons and now these morons have nowhere to go. All the structures like family are gone and community are gone because they're considered abusive. They've been dismantled by, uh, by considering, by classifying all the structures that give them security, that give them a sense of positive life, you know, positive life about themselves. All those considered abusive, oppressive, have been dismantled, then these guys are dependent on the, on whoever has the ability to manage them, brainwash them, whether it's through implants, whether it's through uh, desires being managed as, as morons. So this world disorder, dismantling old structures is akin to saying world disorder. They don't want to say that. They're saying we are dismantling structures of oppression. But when you look down, it all the structures are every structure in the world, because history has been messy, we have to admit, since history has been messy, you can say every structure that exists, the technology education in India is considered oppression, even though technology education is what's creating so much wealth for India and so many jobs and so on, but it is considered oppressive because of whatever, whatever. Silicon Valley is oppressive, it should be dismantled. So everything that consists of civilization's accomplishments should be dismantled. And therefore, what, they, what it amounts to is a world disorder. And this world disorder, the people who are doing it, I call them useful idiots. I think that these billionaires who want to create this new world order, these globalists, want to, uh, 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 this wrecking ball that goes and destroys the past so that you can create something new. These, uh, these wokeism is the useful idiots who will go and wreck, uh, destroy the society, destroy the structures that are coming in the way. Because when yes. you think about it, family values coming in the way to uh, taking over the whole world. Because what they want, the critical race theory want is, the children should not be raised by natural parents with their values. They should be raised by an education system of the state that tells them what the values are. So the state is going to decide through the education system, through the school system, what the values are rather than me as a parent being able to decide that, which is the way we have been, which is the way all the animals are, all the mammals, their parents raise the children. And now it's going to be a state and the state is going to be some kind of an algorithm. It's some kind of an AI system controlled by an oligarchy. So we're headed towards what I could call a global caste system is like some oligarchs at the top and those who are useful idiots working at some level, those who are technocrats who are running this machinery working at some level and so on. And the bottom tier are disposable at some point in time. Uh, in short term, they'll be managed and controlled so they don't create chaos and they don't revolt and they don't raise hell uh, because it's like Netflix, you'll get some kind of a, uh, a plan. Uh, you know, you'll be on a subscription plan and your your the heart implant that keeps your heart going is on a subscription plan and uh, your brain implant and you've got this special implant to have X-ray vision and you could have night vision and you'll be able to see all this stuff like others cannot. So you'll have enhancements in your body and you'll have these desires managed, hormones managed, so you're never going to be unhappy. So all this will be on a subscription plan. And uh, maybe Rajiv bought a silver level plan and Foster bought a gold plan. Somebody else bought a diamond plan. Somebody else bought a platinum plan. So they'll all get different levels of facilities. We are all rented. We are all rented. We don't own anything. We don't own our bodies also. So, so... Yeah. Everything is just, you know, there's a whole movement saying people shouldn't own anything. There's a movement these globalists have started that we should not have ownership of real estate. It should be just renters. We should not have ownership of anything. Like you don't own Office 360, Office, Microsoft Office, you rent uh, 360 on an annual program, $99 or something. So you will be renting your implants because it will not be affordable to buy them. Soon you'll be renting everything, including parts of your body. And so yeah. being on, being a society where everybody's a renter, you the people who are the landlords who own everything, who own the assets, run the show. And that's so, the question. We, that's the we, question. Who are we renting from? Yes. Yes. And, and so, I, I'd like to shine a, a further light on exactly what you're saying from a slightly different perspective. For some people might be kind of grokking this for the first time. That if you if you made a hundred million dollars, I mean a hundred billion dollars uh, already in a, a a capitalist system, and uh, but you're you're a very ambitious person. How in the world can you get wealthier 
than that. You've got you've got from one point of view everything you'll ever need for generations to come. But no, you need to understand what drives a lot of these people. And I know Rajiv and I have, have met some of these people, and it's it's chilling to be in conversation sometimes because the money is simply a scorecard for them at that level. So they always want more. And how do you get more than hundreds of billions of dollars? Well, you run money itself. So you get a central bank, global digital currency with you in charge. And now you've got as much money as you could possibly dream of at your fingertips. And you can take away other people's money if they don't go along with your program. And that leads to the, the second part of this, which is, for a lot of people in the intermediate steps, it's about money. They're getting well compensated, as Rajiv mentioned, and so forth. But at the highest levels, it's not about the money. It's about the power. Yes. And these are people who literally cannot rest at night until they figured out how to get the next level of power. And what does power mean? To them, it doesn't mean spiritual peace. It doesn't mean uh, intimacy in, in your relationships. It doesn't mean the ability to truly help people who are disadvantaged in the world. It means power over other people, as many as possible. And that's why their game is, at least on this planet, is to take over the entire thing. So based on that, let me ask you a very practical question, uh, Rajiv. Who do you see as the lead contender to rule this new world order? Well, I see these uh, these uh, mega billionaire types. And uh, in my new book, I name some Indians. I name Indians because I they are part of this group. Uh, they just want a seat at the table, uh, whether one of them is the fifth richest man in the world or whatever it is, they, they keep competing. And the problem is that the Indian society has been told that these are icons for our cultural success. That if this guy has got so many billion dollars, then it means somehow I as an Indian uh, should be very proud of him. And I'm saying you shouldn't be because what's in it for you? I mean, he's basically, you're a consumer of whatever he's selling. And he said, of course, he's giving you a job. That's okay. It's better than not having a job. But these guys, they're, they're, uh, the scale of money they have and how they're investing it and their idea of philanthropy and the way they are funding Harvard. In this book, I uh, focused on Harvard's role in critical race theory, in cancel culture, in Harvard actually spawned World Economic Forum. Yes. It was a, a Henry Kissinger, Klaus Schwab joint project decades back because uh, Klaus Schwab was Henry Kissinger's favorite student and they came up with this idea. And it was an outgrowth of uh, Kennedy's, uh, you know, Kennedy School. Uh, so K Kissinger, Kissinger uh, mentored Schwab uh, in the Kennedy School uh, of Governance at Harvard. So this whole thing happened, and then this globalism is a pro very ultra left wing version of that. And they're very sophisticated in the way they've corporatized it, brought all the uh, people in. Most of the people who go there have no clue that how they're being co-opted, what they're being co-opted for. They're just given a very nice time. And they're given a five-star, seven-star treatment, and they all come back heroes, and they're very proud of it. But they're being bought into this whole system. So I, I feel that uh, this globalism with people that should be called uh, oligarchs, because we think that there are Russian oligarchs, but we don't think that, we don't think of Indian oligarchs and American oligarchs, and they are. Yes. Oligarch is yes. just somebody who uses his wealth to control other people, including through government, including a, a kind of what you think is the government services behind the government is these guys, like you mentioned, the Federal Reserve, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. and behind yeah. behind many health systems are these oligarchs. So uh, behind uh, social media directly, there are these oligarchs. So I think that this, uh, this group of oligarchy and the oligarchs also more and more people clamoring to join, to comply and say, hey, listen, I'm also worth so many billion, I'll join you guys and give me a seat at the table also. So, and what I don't know is whether these oligarchs will one day fight each other or whether they'll really unite. And is there room for 50 or is there room for 500? I don't know, but it's a highly concentrated group and the rest of us are not in welcome. And right. especially, right. especially critics like you and I, and especially right. critics like you and I, who are 
at a stage in life and in a in a mode where we don't we're not looking for a job we're not looking for their money they can't hire us they can't fire us i mean i basically tell them that i don't i don't need anything from you and whatever you have to offer is not what my real purpose in life is about so you cannot you cannot give me anything useful and what i really want what i really need in my life you cannot give that to me it's up for me to evolve my own consciousness so therefore you cannot harm me or help me in the ultimate sense you can make life miserable for me provisionally in in, the, in some right. practical way so so they hate us because we got the audacity we got the brains we got the articulation we got our own we are sufficiently independent and you know they 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 think they were a real nuisance i mean that's that's what they think of us i think well i think that's a very powerful description that most people probably haven't even considered that um you know when thrive is getting banned off of these various social media platforms and so forth with no reason they never give us a specific reason they usually won't even return emails or phone calls or you know, they just like get rid of us uh or shadow ban us to decrease our our reach and so forth so what is it that they're so concerned about with people like myself and, and like with rajiv and i think that was a, a beautiful description that you're actually free you know you're dedicated to your own freedom and you're dedicated to to supporting other people in being prosperous in being free in thinking whatever they think as long as they're not actually violating someone someone else in their in their actions so i think it's really helpful for the for the people out there to understand that this censorship isn't just about a medical this or an energy this or or, or a, a a fake news this it's truly about suppressing the freedom and consciousness of the human being and so when you talk about the snakes um the other aspects of how those snakes are emerging worldwide is you know when i was uh, an undergraduate at princeton i saw three of my my friends thrilled to be honored with a rose scholarship and go off to to study uh, in england and so forth and i didn't realize till probably 30 years later that they were being targeted for indoctrination into exactly this program because that's what the rose scholarships were created for and then now we've got the most modern example of the world economic forum young global leaders it's exactly the same thing i i interviewed a young guy for for thrive one that later got invited to the world economic forum and and he was this young dynamic crusader and basically he just lost his purpose he would he be literally became one of the woke dictators and i i won't even talk about who he is and so forth. but this is the dynamic that we're that we're seeing worldwide yeah and i think that uh, uh fighting exposing wokeism is a very fundamental thing to do for people yeah. who are free thinkers for the simple reason that while the term means waking up but actually it's suppressing free thought it the whole idea of cancel culture the whole idea of uh, dismantling the structures that they don't like but not not touching their own structures i mean they got their own hierarchy they got their own privileges uh, many of them uh, are, are, are duplicitous people so uh, this this is a dangerous situation because uh young people are not being exposed to the truth they're being exposed to filtered information through the social media and they're spending so much time more and more time on social media and the information being given is filtered so uh you're creating another generation of people with more biases and this is sad because how do we rescue humanity without being able to be able to impact the next generation and we right. can only talk to a few people who are in our immediate circle directly but that's not good enough we need to reach the rest of these 8 billion human beings how do we reach that when the means of uh, conveying information and ideas is so rigged and so uh, somebody can be deplatformed very quickly yeah. and deplatforming is basically an institutional uh, equivalent of cancel culture i mean yeah. when you it's, it's when book you burning yes it's basically what it is so so we have to reclaim our sovereignty in a way that is not contingent on other people uh, right uh, that is what we have to do is is we have to be honest audacious sharp intelligent and fighting for our freedom and not willing to compromise one bit well that's just what i want to spend the rest of our time on but i i want to 
to, to start in on the solutions conversation, uh, again, still with India and your new book in mind, um, I want to talk a little bit about my perception of India's role in this and then get anything you uh, more that you want to add. You're obviously way more familiar than I am. But with uh, one of my first spiritual disciplines was yoga when I was in my 20s. And I got a lot out of it. I, I read a lot of the, the yogic literature and so forth and realized, oh, this is a huge contribution to humanity and a huge contribution uh, to my life. And I was also a big fan of Gandhi. And I, I watched the reclaiming of the sovereignty, uh, at least to some degree, of India from uh, the colonialism and, uh, and also an emergence of worldwide of respect for the Indian spiritual tradition. So I have had high hopes that India with what is a 1.4 billion people or something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah. With, with such a large percentage of the world's population, obviously such intelligence, engineering, knowledge, understanding, a sense of history and so forth. I have had high hopes that India, particularly as part of the BRICS alliance, you know, outside of uh, NATO, outside of the, the kind of Washington consensus, I've had high hopes that India would be a beacon for this challenge of combining the best of our uh, science with the health and engineering and uh, digital technologies and all that with the metaphysics, with the sense that we are uh, that we are not limited to our physical bodies, that uh, that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience for this particular lifetime. And I still hold that out. Um, I think that that's possible, and I think that that India can be a true beacon for both the spiritual and the free market aspects uh, and the science of, of all of this. Um, but tell me how a little more about specifically what do you think is necessary in India to keep it from falling prey and literally losing itself to this Western agenda? No, this is a very important point that you raised. I'm glad we are culminating in this because we want to disclose, jointly explore and discover the way forward. And I think India has a lot of role to play in that. And you've, you've said the right thing that the spiritual discoveries of the ancient rishis, they were like scientists, inner, inner science. They discovered the potential of your consciousness and where you can go and how to do that. And that is, that is like scientific discovery, except not in the external material domain, it's on the inner domain. So this, is a, this was an extra, has been an extraordinary uh, contribution to humanity. And now that India has attained a certain degree of autonomy and sovereignty from the colonial system, there is a revival of education and material comfort so people don't have to be uh, deprived of food. And so there's a lot of these tech engineers and technology. So India has the spiritual, uh, inner engineering and the uh, outer engineering of uh, the con in a conventional sense, the technology uh, to bring it all together and to be a beacon for humanity. Absolutely. And that is what uh, the term they use in India is called Vishwa Guru, which means guru to the world, which mm -hmm. means a spiritual master bringing these ideas to the world. So the traditional term in, in Sanskrit would be Vishwa Guru that our role is to be a Vishwa Guru in a positive sense. That's what it's supposed to be. Now, in this book, I'm arguing that, unfortunately, Harvard has positioned itself as the Vishwa Guru. And the Vishwa Guru of wokeism and this, uh, this spread of uh, the ideology of dismantling and uh, creating chaos and creating a world disorder in order that the new, a new kind of, uh, because of this reset, the, 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 in the model of this World Economic Forum, a whole new order comes about with oligarchy and a digital caste system. That's what my book uh, argues uh, as sort of the tactical use of wokeism to destroy, to dismantle India. So now, right. what do we do about it? I feel that uh, many spiritual leaders in India who carry a lot of weight and have a lot of following are slipping, but haven't. It's not too far to bring them back. They are okay. slipping into this. They are slipping into this because the temptations are too great, and the and the offers 
to buy them out and to make them say the right things. So yes. we are yes. in the midst of a transformation of the whole spiritual movement in a negative side. And I want to stop it. And that's why I'm writing this book, because I want to bring this to the attention of the public with the help of people like you and, and take it to, and I would love to have you, me, we go and meet some of these great masters and explain to them the world dynamics and their role in it. They have to play a role in this because the people of India listen to them. They have followings all over the world and they understand these spiritual processes. They teach them. Uh, so that I think is a good counter to the negative stuff that we've been talking about for the past couple hours. Yeah, the, I learned another uh, term from your book, which is, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Purva Paksha, yes, uh, Purva which you translated Paksha. as critical analysis, because yeah. I think that that's the number one thing that's needed right now is we need an accurate diagnosis of what's going on. That's what you've been doing in your books. That's what our team has been doing in, in our films and, and blogs and so forth. So the critical analysis has to come first if we're going to find that path which actually transcends the uh, the the thesis and antithesis, because I agree with you that the that the the Marxist dialectic has never come to a, a satisfying synthesis. They right. they they stop short at the you know class warfare. Right. What's actually needed is how do we transcend the challenge of. Uh, fake money systems and right. uh and risky artificial intelligence systems and so forth how do we transcend those traps and actually create a thriving world uh for everyone and what are the principles by which we do that and one of the things that's been so exciting to me is my lifetime of research has finally synthesized the scientific principles and the ethical principles have actually come together as one and for me, the, the terminology that I use for the ethical side of that is the non-aggression principle. Yeah. I know that that uh, in the Indian tradition, you have the, the term uh, ahimsa. Yes. And this to me is the, this is the true north of yes. the compass by which we have to navigate through the critical analysis, by which we have to navigate all of these challenges as quickly as possible on a global on a global scale right now. So can you can you talk about how you see what kind of role does uh, ahimsa or a uh, non-violation play for you in the whole uh, AI world? So you know ahimsa is a good compass uh, because uh, ahimsa says that uh, if I am trying to optimize my narrow interest as an ego, and so is everybody else, conflict is inevitable. And that's how the world has been run. But if I'm not interested and not, not uh, uh, preoccupied and obsessed with an endless, unlimited pursuit of my own personal ego goals and desires and power and all of that, and I'm trying to optimize the collective good, and to have the collective good, there has to be harmony, and inside there should be a, a compromise and a and a win-win attitude. So it is not uh, it is non-harming. The uh, himsa himsa is harming, and uh is the negation of that. So the non-harming principle. I don't mm -hmm. want to be driven in in directions that cause harm to other people, and so I want to optimize the minimization of harm. That's what my goal should be. So one of the things to there are two things to think about. One of the things is like we talked about already, which is the evolution of consciousness of every person because higher evolved conscious beings have more harmony with each other. They're less interested in fighting each other over, you know, fighting tooth and nail and causing harm than do people who are less evolved in, in terms of consciousness. The second principle is autonomy and self-organized. That's a very, very deep Indian thought, Indian principle. In fact, it's the cornerstone of all Buddhism the whole idea that there's a self-organization, it is not a hierarchical system. It's not like uh, a system where, uh, you know, there's a dogma and you depend on this dogma. You discover things, you discover your truth. So the self-organizing principle uh, gives a kind of a decentralized, it, for, it, it gives a privilege to a decentralized 
organization of self-organized systems, many, many decentralized self-organized systems, be they nations, be they tribes, be they communities, be they identities, be they individuals, whatever, in a mutual harmony, which is how ecology is. E ecology is that kind of a thing. It's a decentralized system. You don't have a central nervous system in a plant, for example. I mean, you, you have a huge amount of decentralized intelligence. So how to the real challenge is to try and bring that about in humankind. And you know, India was traditionally a very de has been very de decentralized society with hardly a the king's job was not to be a top down power system, but to let every community have their faith, their spirituality, their rituals, do whatever they want. There's no never been like a state religion, never been like a theocracy kind of an idea, never been like an institutional centralized church. Uh, the the tradition of dharma says it's uh, everybody has sva dharma my dharma and yours could be your dharma so this that it starts with that idea that my purpose in life has to be my sva dharma and i have to respect other people for having their sva dharma i am not going to impose mine on them nor am i going to ma mimic theirs because we are made differently and we have to all explore and maybe help each other I have to help a person be, be better in their swadharma rather than trying to convert them to mine. So, mm -hmm. because if I try to convert a person to my religion and I go around and converting people like Christianity did and Islam did, you know, it's a, it's an act of violence because you're denying people their natural identity, their natural sense of heritage and who they are. You're, they, they have to change their I, their name, they have to change their language, all of that. And that's very disruptive. So I think honoring people uh, for their swadharma uh, and helping each other swadharma is a very important thing. Uh, I call it uh, dif difference with mutual respect. Yes. Uh, I, I, I respect you for who you are, and I'd like you to respect me for who I am. And we are different, but we respect each other. We honor each other. We celebrate this about each other. So, so if we if we could educate a new generation along these principles, we'll have a better world. So we have to, yeah. you know. You know, people of our generation, I mean, we're messed up, in, uh, quite honestly. I mean, we, are, we have been messed up with so much. Uh, and I must say that I apologize to the next generation that we have left a very messy world. Uh, you know, it's a, it, uh, uh, but I, uh, how to improve the next, the people who are now kids, uh, the teenagers and pre-teenagers, requires access to the education system, requires access to large media, this requires some resources, and then these values can be transmitted. Yeah. Well, the what you're describing with this differences with mutual respect is exactly the opposite of <clears throat> the Great Reset, or what I call the global domination uh, agenda. I, I actually see that agenda as the result of, in a sense, a death cult. And I don't mean that in an exaggerated way. I mean it very, very literally that the the practices of these people with their endless wars of uh you know human made famines and pandemics and so forth um but ultimately taken to the to its full extent i think that either intentionally through creating the so called digital singularity you know literally turning over human consciousness supposedly to digital robots, uh, or inadvertently, just through uh, the weaponry that we have on planet Earth getting out of hand as all the oligarchs are fighting with us and fighting, fighting with each other, uh, and it just gets out of hand and, and ends up that you know kind of taking us out of the evolutionary game right now for a you know a few hundred million years or something like that. In any case, that agenda is leading toward the death of not only many individuals, but of the human species itself. And the, if any of you listening are not familiar with the term singularity, this is uh, Ray Kurzweil, I think, uh, coined this phrase. And he means that point at which the, the uh, artificial intelligence so far surpasses human intelligence that basically we turn over the reins to them. and. I have talked with and debated with many of the top transhumanists, and it's been a chilling experience. The common denominator that I found is number one, usually they're very smart, they're very technically uh, highly trained, but have no sense of 
their spiritual existence or their metaphysical existence uh, at all. I mean, literally at all. And so therefore, they, because they're afraid of dying and don't know how to deal with that, they're uh, you know, subscribing to cryogenic clubs where they can get frozen and hopefully be brought back. And they're bringing their parents, trying to bring their parents back and all this. Stuff. Basically, I see a, a, a very deep fear of living itself because they don't know yet who they are in an expanded sense. Because yes. if you know that you're all of existence focused into your particular Taurus, your particular physical body, your particular portal of consciousness, then it's, well, you know, then you celebrate and you, you can celebrate aging. You can celebrate dying as you, you know, you go on to your next adventure and so forth. But if you think that your consciousness is just an epiphenomenon of the random molecular activity in your gray matter, it can be terrifying as you get older. And that's what I see again and again in these people who are dedicated to creating the singularity and trying to get their own immortality by, uh, by becoming digital or turning over humanity as if that's a good thing evolutionarily. So my antidote to that is to create a humanitarian singularity where humanity someday reaches the emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual maturity that we under the at least a critical mass of humanity realizes, and I mean that word very literally, realizes, comes into the reality of who we are, and then naturally uh, enjoys the bliss of being alive on this gorgeous planet and enjoys the honoring the sovereignty of every individual spiritual being and the creativity that naturally flows through them when they are not being coerced or crushed by by uh, by outside powers and i i think this is the conversation maybe this is the conversation we can flesh out for the world rajiv is yeah. uh, how can we create proactively the humanitarian singularity while using digital technology to the best of its advantage, but always with the guideline of it always has to be voluntary. We yes. can't coerce, impose, trick people into giving up their spiritual nature uh, and their, their individual sovereignty um, because of someone else's plan. So this is brilliant. What you've done is a good summary of what we are, uh, what we're both uh, trying to achieve. The Indian philosopher Sri Aurobindo, and I'll send you the link, wrote about this. Uh, he died uh, 70 years ago or so. Uh, huge tradition of India, he summarized for modern people, the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of human beings to a higher species, uh, the whole process, what it means, how to do it, why it's important. And that has been one of my guiding principles. So when I hear you say that, it is so important for me. It is so meaningful for me because I relate to it. And so yeah. I, I'm delighted that we met each other and from such different origins and backgrounds and so on, we've come to similar conclusions. And I think this is a, this is a, a journey, a shared journey and a collaboration that uh, I'm going to enjoy. So I, I really want to thank you for all this. Yeah. Well, just on a little bit of a further uh, personal note, I um, I really benefited tremendously from several years of study of, of Sri Aurobindo's work, and I um, and I recently visited his center down in Ojai in Southern California and yes. got to see the library there and, and so forth. But the one further thing I wanted to say about this, and just to to end our our discussion really with as much time as we need to talk about the nature of the solutions that are needed. Because I think that the solutions are that are needed are in every sector of human endeavor. They, are, they will be the result of countless individuals fulfilling their own dreams according to natural principles. Nobody can come up with a, uh, a realistic business plan for 
the, the, the movement to a thriving society. We, we can make suggestions, we can identify principles, and then we can identify strategies and tactics that, that can be helpful along the way. And that's what we're trying to do. One topic you and I haven't had a chance to talk about yet, and on, an, on another occasion, we'll go into real depth on it. But the, the main thing that we're doing at Thrive right now is creating what we call the Thrive Solutions Hub. And this is uh, looking to empower ethical solutionaries worldwide with a, an open source, uh, secure platform that's uh, on independent servers, redundant in multiple countries and so forth. Um, and uh, and you, anyone can access this uh, as long as they're behaving ethically. That's the only criterion for, for being a member of this, this global association of ethical solutionaries. And we've got it broken down by, by uh, 13 sectors, which cover all of human endeavor, and then sub-issues within each sector so that people can follow what other people are doing to actually successfully solve problems in every sector. They can look up by issue. Um, they can look up by sector. They can look up by local region. There's a map where you can find uh, other people who are of like mind uh, in your local area, or you can connect with them virtually and then create what we call a space, which is just you create a digital space uh, and then welcome people if you want to or have or have very private groups in your space. And then you'll not only be able to find other people's spaces that you would be interested in following and other people follow yours, but you can both share resources. So if you have, uh, you know, great books like the ones that you're coming out with, um, if you win, win a lawsuit, you have a petition that's particularly successful. And rather than everybody around the world having to recreate that wheel, people can voluntarily upload that information to our shared resources space. And then anybody can access it very quickly and very inexpensively. And then the, the, the final kind of vision of it is we, we're looking to help create what we call the network for networks worldwide. <clears throat> and the intention is to help facilitate the largest ethical grassroots activist movement in human history, not to micromanage it, tell it what to do, any, any of that type of stuff, but simply provide a secure platform that is as open as you want it to be, that is totally decentralized, um, and where you join simply by being ethical. And then people can if they got a very important message of an event coming up, like you like you could promote your tour through uh, sending a message to the coordinators of all of the different groups in the Solutions Hub. So you're not violating their trust by going directly to their email groups, but you, but you can send a message to the leaders of all these different groups, and then they choose whether or not they want to pass it on to their list. Totally voluntary, uh, of course, and that way we safeguard the the sovereignty and the trust that each person has built with their own following. And as long as we honor that, and as long as we're associating only through uh, the non-aggression principle, I think we've got the makings to broadcast messages very quickly, uh, and so that you're not just random putting it on some social media or something like that, but you're getting it out to like-minded people, to groups that have cohered around truth and freedom worldwide rather than around a particular religion or race or creed or, or gender or ethnicity or class or whatever. It transcends all of that and goes directly to these fundamental principles that we've been exploring. So uh, so that's our major contribution that we're, uh, we've been in beta for uh, about a year now and it, we're, we're getting ready to launch in the next few months to actually open it up to the public. There's several hundred groups and thousands of individuals who've been trying it, and now we've got it working well. So we're getting set to launch this to the public and we'll definitely keep you posted and we'll look forward to, to including you if you're interested in, yes. in the Thrive Solutions Hub as well. Absolutely, I would love to. This, uh, this is excellent. And so right. when I'm in the Bay Area, we should spend more time uh, yes. understanding, understanding your work more than I've watched the documentaries, I'm very impressed. But the future, what, what these kind of developments that you're doing, 
Uh, when I come there, maybe we can spend some more time uh, listening to you and your presentations on what the plans are and how we can participate. We would love to do that. Well, that would be fantastic. So um, I want to close by having you just have an opportunity to say anything else that you want to about solutions uh, and then just share uh, a, a final message for this particular section with our audience worldwide. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Foster, for thinking of this, uh, this nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting together between the two of us, uh, some vad, as we call it, a good, happy, uh, mutual brainstorm uh, discussion. Uh, it's been very enlightening for me. I want to learn more about the pragmatic solutions that your systems are developing, which is very good. Metaphysically and philosophically, we are aligned. And now it's time to sort of take it forward. And I would love to be a part of it and understand it, how we can, how we can, Help each other. Maybe we can be a subscriber to what you are uh, what you are doing. I would I would definitely want to do that. Uh, my message uh, regarding uh, my own work is uh, that I you know we are we are not we are very critical in my books, but we don't we're not trying to be personal against anybody. Uh, we we if we don't like the work they are doing, we will say that. But we think there's deep inside uh, the, a core with, of, of goodness that can be revived and we would like to do that. So, so our, our hope is that when we give this food for Paksha, this critical analysis, at least some of the people will rethink and want to kind of re-examine what they're up to and maybe even join us. So we are not looking for, an, we are not an antithesis to their thesis. We don't want that clash. We would rather have harmony. We would rather shake them out. Like the Zen koans, you know, you shake people out of that fixation that they have. And the fixation, the, the fixation they have is a course of action that cannot be won. There is, you cannot, by, by dismantling structures, creating chaos, hope to build a new world order that will do you good. You cannot, you just cannot do that. You will not, and you'll just create more misery. So with that, I would like, uh, on, a, on a positive note, I would like to uh, suggest to people that read my books, the new one that's coming out, the AI one that was already out and others, go and watch Foster's uh, documentaries. And, uh, you know, maybe the two of us can create some kind of a, we, uh, something where people can join, you know, people can join some kind of a, uh, organization or be a member of something to stay informed, to stay informed of what these developments are as we go forward. Because I don't have uh, a kind of a large, systemic organization. I have a huge number of followers, mm -hmm. but I haven't organized them into a, into kind of a, 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 you know, a systematic force. They're just there. They're just there. And I'm so happy and so fortunate when I go to different cities, a large number of people that I can consider part of an extended family, but you've organized all this. And I think we can learn from each other. Well, that, that will be very exciting. Uh, and, you know, when I stand back and look at the larger picture, people are often really shocked to hear the, how confident I am that truth and love will prevail on this planet. And actually way sooner than, than people think, because, and I don't say that out of ignorance, you know, I'm obviously well-informed about the problems that we're facing, but because I'm also well-informed about the nature of consciousness, about, uh, about the human spirit and about the, the nature of the unified field itself. And because of that, I, I know that we have truth and we've got love and we've got the life force itself on our side because we've chosen to, to align with that. And more and more people are doing that worldwide. And that, that gives me great confidence for the future. And meeting someone like you, uh, Rajiv, you know, for, for the audience out there, we've just met recently through, we were each asked to be advisors for a new organization uh, called Ethical AI and the Ethical AI Institute. And this organization, uh, as I, when I set out to make my, my last film, I got off all the boards and foundations and everything that I was on in order to really focus my efforts. And I've only uh, joined two things uh, after the movie came out. And one of them was the advisory board of this Ethical AI Institute. And that's because the issues we've been talking about today, uh, I think that the end game of the new world order is transhumanism and is to actually get rid of the human species to serve a much 
uh, larger and darker agenda. And in order to preclude that agenda, um, we need to start right now, and that's what we're doing with educational programs, with certification programs. And you know, companies are beginning to come into these certification programs now and learn about what what are the principles of true human ethics and how do they apply to AI. So that's how Rajiv and I met just recently. And then, as I read his book and as he watched the the Thrive movies, which by the way, are available at thriveon.com if anybody hasn't seen them uh, yet. Uh, that's how we've met. And I, I'm just tremendously privileged to have had you on this call today and then excited about what we and our networks and our friends and like-minded people worldwide can now do together. Because there's never been a more dangerous time in human existence where we can destroy the whole thing with our technology. And there's never been a more exciting time with the technologies and with the consciousness that is on this planet now to actually break through, align with those principles and create a, uh, create a thriving humanity on a gorgeous, wonderful, healthy planet. So thank you for your time today, Rajiv. I really enjoyed, have a successful and healthy tour and come see me when you get back. We will do that. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be in touch and work together. Thank you everybody for Great. watching.